I'm on. <laughs> Karen Barbie Atkinson is my name. I'm the baby boomer belly dancer because I've been Karen Barbie for 58 years. I've only had the Atkinson for the last 26. So 58, that means I was born in 1962. That's the tail end of the baby boomer, whatever that is, era. Is that what it is, an era? Yeah, generation, that's cool, that's cool, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I qualify as a baby boomer. Mm -hmm. Dancing is my life, you know, it really is. Even when, even when I try to do other stuff, uh, you know, if, if, if my husband was here right now, he would say, oh, she graduated from high school when she was 16, and she graduated from college when she was 19 with a double major in computer science and accounting, and it sounds really good, but when you really stop and think about it, it's a little bit um, pathetic. <laughs> it's like, who, who are you trying to impress and why? You know, that, that overachieving kind of thing, and, and I think that a lot of that is born of being in things that you didn't really like that much, you know, just kind of rushing through them and... Um, I won't say all of school was like that. I think I enjoyed high school. I was a dance team captain. But in college, you know, I majored in accounting and computer science, mostly because Daddy wanted me to. He wanted me to get a good job, and that was his idea. So, you know, I, I did all that, and I went to work in the corporate world for 12 years and, um, and then quit and just start, kept, kept dancing. So I've been in dance studio since I was five years old and uh, with no breaks ever, ever, and... Um, so what year would that have been? 1967, I was five years old. And then 1996 is when, finally, and when I finally <laughs> quit everything else to dance full time. Um, never quite dancing in between there. I was always, you know, living in dance studios and doing all kinds of different dancing. But 1996 is when I went as a full time belly dancer, belly dance instructor. Oh my God, no, no. I hear about the, the wealth and um, wonderful assets of many of my contemporaries in the corporate world who stayed and, and did all that. But, you know, even when I was there, I can remember, I, was, I think about this often, actually, I can remember sitting in management meetings and people would go around the table and talk about things and I would just be like, how do they know to say all that? Like, the, the place just never made sense to me. It's just not, you know, it's just not, it was never my thing, the corporate world. And I had a hard time since I was in information systems, you know, I had a hard time connecting what I was doing to what mattered out there to the people who purchased the product. It was so far removed. I mean, you know, those, those companies are so huge. And so, I mean, you know, I get it. I, I do understand it better now, having thought about it. But like right out of college, when you're 19 years old and you're trying to connect those dots and see what matters, it, it, really, it really was a stretch for me. And I just never got my head around it. I stayed 12 years. I think that you know, got good promotions, good raises, all that. You know, I can, I can create the illusion of playing the game, but it was just never where my heart was. Belly dancing. I gave it up for belly dancing. You know, I started belly dancing, like I said, when I was 10 years old and did it all through high school, college, all of that. My first job was as a belly dancer at an Indian restaurant. <laughs> I remember asking the owner, the Indian man, um, do people belly dance in India? And he's like, ah, so this is 1979, right? He's like, eh, don't worry about it. Uh, Americans don't know the difference. <laughs> This is before CNN and all the internet and all that. I guess he was right. But yeah, so that was my first job, dancing in a restaurant. I was 16. I was right out of um, high school. So, and, and then my second job was in the corporate world. And then my third job was back to belly dancing. Oh, there you go. That's me. That's me. You ask who I am? So complicated. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so it was 1988 when I, well, hold on, let me back up a little bit more. Um, I started teaching my first classes when I was 18 years old. So my, I got into belly dancing. This will come up at some point, I'm sure, and I definitely want her to be one of my guests. I got into belly dancing because of my big sister, Barbara. And uh, so that's another story, and we'll hold that for another podcast. But she taught classes until she had her third child, and then she just got really busy being a mom. I had taken every class she'd ever taught. And so when she bowed out to be with her family full time, she turned over her classes to me. Again, I was 18 years old. And so that's when I started teaching. Um, and that was through Dillard's Department Store Special Events Centers. Thank you very much. It's like a big room in the basement of the department store. And you, mm -hmm. yeah, you learn something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's what I did for a while. I don't know how long. And then, then I started renting places out of other studios, um, you know, and teaching classes and 
I, I don't know what our goal was, like what kept people coming so for the life of me. I can't remember what it was. I think that we, at the time, as a group, maybe attended a lot of workshops and stuff hosted in other cities. And so maybe we would work on dances to present at those workshops. Like dancing. I didn't need that. I didn't. Know. But you know what? We also performed in malls now that I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, well, anyway, so that's what kept people coming to class. So that was all the way up until 1988. 1988 is when I actually opened Caravan Studio. I had been renting space out of a place called Mothers in Motion here in San Antonio on Lock Hill Selma. And she ended up going out of business, and so I just took over her studio. Now, this is, this is kind of comical, because here I am with a degree in accounting and computer science, and <laughs> you would think that I would put together a business plan of some kind and see if it was really feasible to quit my job and, and, and try to run a dance studio, but I didn't. And so in 1988, I actually quit my job for one year <clears throat> until I ran out of money, rented that location on Lock Hill Selma, um, and put a ton of classes on the schedule, invited some other people to come and teach. Again, it lasted a year and I was out of money. <laughs> I had to tuck my tail between my legs and go back into the corporate world and say, can I have my job back for a little while, please? So that was, that was, that was an interesting thing. But I did keep that, that studio. Once I got my corporate job back and I had more money coming in, I did keep that studio and keep it going. Part of what my, my struggle was during that time, and I'm, that time being from like 1988 to, <clears throat> I'm going to say 96 when I quit again, was that that is when the nightclubs in Houston uh, were having me go and dance there on weekends. And so I was really split between wanting to be a studio owner, which takes a lot of energy and focus, and wanting to be a nightclub performer, which really dilutes the focus on a studio. And it's difficult to do both, especially when they're in two different cities. Like the nightclubs are in Houston, the studios in San Antonio. It's just insane when you think about it, you know, but I just hadn't done the math. I was, I was, just wanting to take every opportunity come in my way. And so, so that was that. Those were those lovely years from 88 on. In 1996, um, so I ended up moving out of that Lock Hill Selma studio in the early 90s, I believe. And then I was just, again, renting space all over the city, <laughs> whatever I could find. And God bless the students that, that stuck with me. And I mean, some of them are still with me today. <laughs> <clears throat> well, Janet, Vern, you know, you know them. Hell, you know <laughs> really long time. And so anyway, my, my, my point was, <laughs> I think, because it was my journey, right? That's what I'm still talking about. So um, renting spaces out of studios and a, a lot of the really loyal folks stayed with me wherever I went until I quit that corporate gig again in 1996, this time with a plan, this time with <laughs> some uh, more money saved up, this time with, um, you know, just an idea of what needed to happen to make it succeed, having messed it up the last time. I was no longer going to the clubs in Houston every single weekend. And, and so that one stuck in 1996. And so that was the location down on South Alamo street downstairs, um, in this tiny, tiny little space. It was unfinished when I went and looked at it. And then a couple of great guys came in and finished it out and even put tile in the floor that said caravan. And it's still there to this day. I think there's a 728 South Alamo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you go in there, it's a restaurant now. I can't remember what the name of it is. But if you go in there, go all the way to the back and over to the right, and you will see that there's um, there's some tile on the floor, and it says caravan. It's awesome. Yeah. So I was there and then uh, moved upstairs in that same building to a larger studio. And then I had moved into that area for urban revitalization because it was kind of a downtrodden part of town, and they were trying to get some businesses to move in. So I was one of the businesses that moved in, and then the urban revitalization worked, and I couldn't afford the rent anymore. <laughs> and then I moved out of there, and I took the studio over on North St. Mary Street. I was over there from 2001 to 2007. Then I took a two-year break uh, trying to figure out what I really wanted to do because it had all just gotten so big. We probably had about 300 students and that was the mothership there on North St. Mary's, but we were also renting studio spaces all over town and in the little, like Selma, out in the suburbs and stuff. And it was just out of control. It felt out of control. It felt like it was running me instead of me running it. So I took a two-year hiatus, taught two classes a week. That was it. Again, just renting space. And then I found a little cubbyhole over on Mulberry Street in 2009, stayed there 
from 2009 until last year, where are we? No, two years ago, 2019. I stayed there for 10 years. And, and that people who don't belly dance would consider amazing all of it, right? You know, when you see somebody out there belly dancing, it's not something you do. You're just like, oh my God, that looks so cool. Oh my God, I could never do that. All that kind of, so just right off the bat, you know, <laughs> I think it seems kind of amazing. And I always say some, some people email me or call me monthly and say they want to come and take classes, but it just takes so much to get the nerve up because it seems so far outside of the boundaries of normal behavior, you know? So, so, you know, at, at a certain level, any of it seems amazing, but I, I think that probably like what's really been, um, what's felt like big success to me has been, I guess when I first got invited on the workshop circuit, you know, that, that, that used to be a huge, 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 huge deal. Um, you know, getting invited to travel around and, and teach your form of instruction to belly dance students all over the place. And so, I, you know, I've been all over the country and um, even to China and through South America doing a lot of that, um, you know, and that always felt like, felt like a pretty amazing deal. Certainly any, any times that I was um, dancing with, with live music, to this day, that feels like a really amazing deal. You know, uh, I mean, that's my love. I'm sure we'll get into that more, right? Let me tell you, I, I, um, I reference my fear of public speaking and my growth into public speaking a lot when I'm talking to my dancers about improvisation, you know, um, because, because I learned quickly that whether you were given a one minute intro or, a, a 10 minute tribute or a 20 minute keynote, <laughs> you know, you needed to get everybody to feel with you. You needed to get everybody happy for a little while. You needed to pull everybody in. You needed to spike it. You needed to drop it. You really need to do a lot of stuff to hold their attention in, a, in, in whatever time you have. And it's true in a piece of music too, you know, and, and, and I, I often think about how petrified I was at public speaking. Oh my God. When we did that first shades of green luncheon and I had to be the MC for like two freaking hours. And <laughs> it was so scary trying to tie one speaker to the next and you've got to be cute about it, right? You've got to, you got to link it all together and, and there's no way to know how you're going to do that until you just do that. And, um, yeah. So yeah, improv is improv. Guylin, you're doing a great job at it right now. <laughs> I remember writing an article one time talking about my growth spurts, like through my dance career would have been my growth spurts. And there were, I think, three big ones. One was teaching. You know, if you really want to know how well you know something, try to explain it to somebody else, right? And so becoming a teacher was was huge. Not only that, but I can remember talking to this very famous dancer, Amani of Lebanon. And she was saying to me, she said, you know, I think I need to start teaching. This was like, oh my God, like in the mid nineties. She said, I think I need to start teaching because if you tell people your your stuff and what you do, then you're going to feel that need to create more. And she was looking for that reason to create more. It was brilliant, really. And there's a lot of truth to it. Like I'd never thought about it, but you know, not just because I have students that have been with me for 20 something years, <laughs> 30 years, but, but for myself, you know, when you start communicating what you know, then it's like, okay, well now what, you know, and if you love what you do, you'll start really digging to find out now what, you know, so teaching was a huge growth spurt. Another growth spurt was just becoming a gym rat when I went to the gym constantly and was finding, um, just ways to talk about muscles and, and the way we were making movements happen that hadn't really occurred to me before, you know, but just finding those muscles from a different direction by being in the gym constantly, I felt like helped me to be a better teacher and performer. But the, by far the biggest growth spurt that I experienced was when I got to work with musicians in Houston every weekend for, you know, decades really. And, and not just that, but hang out with them, you know, and ask them, you know, what does that mean? What is this music? Why, how is this different? And watch them literally sit there and watch them watch VHS videos that they were sent from back home, freezing a frame, you know, backing up, playing this little, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah, that was a huge, huge advantage, you know, to be able to sit there with those guys and, and like they, they would literally play a Lasma <laughs> and that's like this little instrumental interlude, like between vocals or whatever like a note or two long, they would sit there and play it over and over on the tape. And then they'd get out their keyboard and they'd replicate it. And they, you know, just like zooming in on these tiny, tiny details. And 
mostly with George Wasouf. He was the main singer that they loved and would watch. And yeah, just being there and, and, and watching them and looking at how seriously they took the creation of the sound that you were dancing to, you know? I was not serious. I was young and gorgeous, okay? So <laughs> ask any young, gorgeous dance. I thought I was serious. I thought I was serious. Um, and, and maybe I was kind of, sort of, you know, like it was my life, you know, like I'd already, um, you know, quit the job once or twice. <laughs> And I was, and, and, and making money doing it, you know, I was serious about being better in terms of what my American audience thought that was, which is super way different than becoming a better artist, you know, no, what made me want to dig into the culture, the language, the region, the politics, you know, go spend two weeks in the Gaza Strip, that kind of stuff. What made me want to do that was getting into an environment where I could meet the people from that side of the world. And that started with the musicians. And I, you know, Michael, when he had asked me about cultural appropriation, yes, he's the conductor of the National Arab Orchestra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a whole separate podcast talking about how I found Michael. <laughs> Michael's awesome. Yeah, yeah. But he also had asked me um, during that same interview how I was received amongst the Arab American population because of, you know, who I am and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 you know, I, I honestly just really hadn't even entertained anything negative in that regard because it's always been so, so fun. You know, that, that population has always been very gracious with me and never, you know, had a, had a sense of what the hell do you think you're doing, you know, with our stuff. I don't know. Um, I mean, honestly, as I sit here and think about it, because I hadn't thought quite this far about it, you know, when I first approached a lot of the Arab American community in San Antonio, I was kind of a child, you know? Um, I no, know, I didn't. And, and so they, I think there was a sense of taking me under their wing, maybe even a little bit, you know? I mean, I'm like, I'm the 16 year old out there dancing, you know? And if there are Arab Americans in the in the audience, they're, they're not going to, you're not inclined to look at a teenager and think, who the hell is she? You know, it's like, oh, sweetheart, you know, why are you interested in this? That's interesting, you know, that kind of thing. And so I, I feel like maybe they had a, a part of raising me and all of that, if, 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 if I can say it that way, you know? Mm -hmm. And there are people, you know, when the National Arab Orchestra came here to San Antonio for their very first concert, Open Parent, their first concert in the state of Texas, Close Parent, in... January of 2018, there were people in attendance at that concert that I hadn't seen since I was dancing in restaurants. And it was like a reunion. It was so cool. You know, members of the Arab American community here in San Antonio, Karen, I haven't seen you in 20 years, Karen. You know, it was so fun. So fun. But, but I think it has to do with that. Like they kind of feel like they were there watching me grow into all of this. And now here I am, hosting this, this, this orchestra in town and they're right there to support all that too, you know, well, to me, I mean, I can't really talk to, <laughs> you know, I mean, Michael Ibrahim was the founder. He was, oh my God, I mean, he's young now. So he was super young when he, he, he did all of that. And it was originally the Michigan Arab Orchestra and it was just a small group of students, I believe when he was in college, but it's, it's blossomed into this massive entity now. I mean, they just played a concert in Saudi Arabia, you know, at the end of 2019 and and they draw their musicians from all over the, well, world, really, all over the country for their concerts that are here in the United States. But when they went to Saudi Arabia, they actually brought in um, people from Egypt and Lebanon and all that to, to work with the orchestra. Because Michael, you know, he, he pulls it all together. That's just, that's what he does. And so he can, as long as you're a very accomplished musician, you can be a part of that and, and he'll, you know, pull it all together in a relatively short time. So, um that's the National Orchestra. And I'm on the board. I've been on the board since, um, since 2018, I guess. But, you know, I, I found them because of Michael. I found them because of my love for live music and my desire to bring live music to San Antonio every year as a part of the studio's annual showcase. And I've been doing that, having live music be a part of my studio's annual showcase. I've been doing that since 1995. 
And that was all born of my work with the musicians in Houston, right? But when I got more serious about all of the live music stuff, and that's another story. Are you taking notes? Because these are all excellent stories to come later. <laughs> Just kidding. I guess we don't need notes because it's all recorded, right? <laughs> okay, okay, great. But when I, when I started diving deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the live music, then I started bringing the musicians from Houston, which is keyboards and percussion, right? And augmenting them with other instruments. And so that, that was Nasser Musa uh, on Oud out of Los Angeles. That was, yes. And then George Lamont on violin out of San Francisco. And then I wanted, he's a sweetheart. And then, and I've known him since the clubs in Houston, actually. But then I wanted the sound of the Nye, the Arab flute, right? I really wanted that. And so I was on YouTube searching, searching, searching for who can do that. And that's how I found Michael because he is a, that was probably 2015. Michael, I, I met Michael Ibrahim in 2016 and he came to San Antonio for the first time to play at our annual show in 2017. So yeah, it has not been long. It is, it has been so short, Guylan. Let me tell you this. Okay. This is profound. Ready? It has been such a short period of time since I was watching Michael Ibrahim on a YouTube video thinking, how do I find this kid <laughs> to now? to now, all right, where I talked to him earlier today, <laughs> right? That block of time has been so short that I think about it whenever I want to try to make myself believe anything is possible. Like literally, that is the example. You know, the live music, um, I'm, I'm not going to lie, you know, whenever I, I hear it, it evokes some really great memories, <laughs> you know, uh, times in Houston and all of that. So there's a lot under the surface for me with live music, but it's never the same. You know, you can bring in, oh hell, you can bring in the guys from Houston to play this weekend and they play a set and next weekend you hear that same set and it's going to be different because in, in, well, I'm getting to that. Just calm down. I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. And so, so that, that to me is extremely entertaining and here's why, here's what you're going for. I think. Because if you're dancing to music that is being played live, especially by Arab musicians, because they're going to improvise differently every time you are, you are showing your fluency, your fluency in this dance form, not how many steps you've memorized, not, not your ability to remember that combination that you learned in that workshop, your, your fluency. If you are really in the moment responding in movement to what you're hearing them do, including the, the, beautiful little ornaments and nuances that are happening just because it occurred to them at that moment and they're doing that and you respond to it, you, you have got to be a master of your craft. And, and I think that that's just something that we don't do a lot of, you know, testing the fluency, making sure that you can access everything you've learned based on a musical cue, you know, and, and you must somewhat know what I'm going to say because this is coming on the heels of the live music discussion. <laughs> well, I, I feel like, I mean, I just feel like it's all about live music. And I feel like coming out of this COVID hell <laughs> where live is, yeah, live is so limited that maybe even, um, you know, there was in my opinion, not an adequate appreciation amongst the dance community for live music. I mean, I know it's, it's scary and it's expensive and all of that kind of stuff, but it's so worth it, man. It's so worth it if you just give it a chance. And so I feel like now coming out of this COVID, there might be an even deeper appreciation for live, live everything. You know, I see all the dancers talking on Facebook about they can't wait to get out and perform live again. They can't wait to have an audience again. And, you know, if you, if you just think about that and, 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 and broaden that idea to, to you know, what, what they're saying is, is that energy exchange that happens when, when you're right there and the people are right there too. You don't get it when you're in a virtual hafla. You don't. You don't. I don't care how cool your room looks. And you don't. And and so I feel like this is a, a, a we're actually poised to make a, a bigger case for that extra energy if you're not up there on stage by yourself even. Like you love that exchange between you and the audience, just 
just imagine, you know, having that exchange between you and the guys behind you or girls creating the sound, that team, you know, putting out this gorgeous presentation and you as a dancer listening so intently and having the vocabulary and the accessing mechanisms and the fluency to be able to work with that team of musicians and put out this beautiful presentation live and having that audience feel that. And, you know, yeah, it's just such a big deal. And here I am, baby boomer belly dancer. Okay, fine. You know, I'm old. <laughs> but when I, when, I, when I look at a lot of my dancers in Project Band, I mean, there's some that are very, very new. And I do think there's a tremendous benefit to building your dance vocabulary and testing your fluency as you do that. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a brave courageous thing to do, but I think it's, it's a massive benefit then rather than waiting until your library is full of stuff. And now you're going to try to figure out if you can find what you want in the moment when you're dancing on stage. But my point is going to be that many of the dancers that do this live music program have been dancing for a decade or two or more because live music is that inspiring. You know, what the hell else is there to do? Like, think about it. This is your, this is not their, their job. This is not their career. This is their, their hobby, their avocation. They love it. But you know, if, if they couldn't do it anymore, they'd be sad for a little while and then they'd replace it with something else. So you've got to have that thing that keeps you interested. And my point is after enough time has passed, 10, 20 years, what is that thing? You know, it's the next prop. I don't think so. The, the next pretty costume, I don't think so. You're going to tie silk to baby cakes. As you get older, you dread the costumes, okay? Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's not about that. Mm -hmm. my, my costuming now is much more simple and like, it's just not about that. You know, it's just not about that. It's not about that look like it was when I was 27 and and that's what, that's what the baby boomer thing, to me, that's, um, that, that's what matters as a, as a baby boomer ability answer. Number one, I'm old. I've been doing this a really long time. And the things that, that hold your interest after a really long time are, are, are different, you know, it, it, depth, <laughs> I believe depth. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, after you, and I was just pondering this earlier, um, oops, sorry, I'm not supposed to tap on things because you hear everything. Sorry. <laughs> I was just pondering this earlier, um, in a different context, but I think it's true for everything in life. You know, you, you learn the, the basics and then you make a decision about number one, do I care about this anymore at all? And if I do, how do I get more, you know? And, and so do you, do you go wider and keep it pretty shallow and, and M ho. Okay. And it's just my ho, <laughs> but to me, in my honest opinion, M ho, you know, accumulating costumes in different colored eyelashes and, um, and props, you know, and you can, you can, you can back me into a corner on that. I don't care. But all of that is, is width. It's, it's taking that, that thing, those steps that you've learned, those things that you've learned and seeing how you can embellish that and, and buy yourself some more time and interest. The other option that I see is, is depth. And that's, um, digging into the culture, digging into the language, digging into the composers, digging into the, the original singers and what's their story and all of that kind of stuff, aspects about the region and all, all, all of, all of those kind of things. That's, that's my choice. That's, that's what I look for. And I think that I once drew this little bell curve about like who I believed was in the belly dance world. <laughs> so at the, at the low end here, it was like all of the beginners coming in that are looking for fantasy or fitness. The big, big, big group are those that are like, Oh my God, I'm performing now and people are clapping and this is so cool. And now I need more costumes and I need more veils and all that kind of stuff. And way over here on the other end is the group of people that are digging into who are these composers and, um, how did Um Kultum work with Balig Hamdi to create, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, you don't, you don't jump there right away. All right. I mean, I spent a whole bunch of time up here accumulating costumes and makeup and all of that kind of stuff. I did. It's just, I'm old. I've been doing this a long time. And at a certain point, you've got to look for what more is there. And, and then you end up 
looking, looking into that depth. So my point was just that the baby boomer thing, I think, um, suggests that I've, I've lasted long enough to, to study the depth. That's the number one thing. Number two, because I'm a drilling maniac. I love to develop crazy drills that test the, the planes of movement of our body and how we can layer things together. And I'm, I'm still a good layer of things when I perform. I attribute a lot of that to these crazy drills. But as I've gotten older, I have realized that, that putting your, your brain, okay, never mind what's doing for me physically and what I'm able to produce on stage because of it, but putting your brain through that kind of stuff is so important and, 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 and beneficial. You know, as I read about contemporaries of mine and, and just maybe a little bit older, you know, and, and all of the, the cognitive challenges that we are faced with as we continue to inhabit the planet, always, always, always neuroscientists, neurologists, neurosurgeons point to these kind of things, these kind of drills, working through these kind of exercises as, as a way to fight dementia, Alzheimer's, all that to keep your brain active. And, you know, like we're here, we're doing it already. And, and I, while I had only really appreciated the physical benefits of it before now, more than ever, I'm really, really appreciating that it's presence in my life for the, for what it's doing for my brain. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think we will be. I am belly dancing baby boomer. <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. 